Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today I'm bringing you a very interesting episode with an awesome guest, and actually a series of guests, as you'll see throughout this episode, because I wanted to bring you some YouTube historians who have their own opinions on the matter, but I also wanted to bring you the experts themselves. This episode is a break away from ancient and medieval history, as many of you will have guessed by the title, and instead launches our series where we cover controversial topics within modern history. This one being, were the Nazis, otherwise known as the NSDAP, actually socialists? It could be complicated, it could be simple, but that's why I have the experts here to walk us through this fascinating topic. And so without further ado, Dr. Eric Kurlander, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. And before we begin, Dr. Kurlander, for those who may not be familiar with your honestly awesome work, would you mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm a professor of modern European history at Stetson University in uh, Florida, central Florida. And I got my PhD at Harvard University. I um, studied the political history of German liberalism and wrote a book on that um, about 12, 15 years ago. And then I also wrote about liberals in the Third Reich and how they kind of negotiated what it was like to be a liberal Democrat um, under Nazism. And from there, moved into the last book, which is titled Hitler's Monsters, A Supernatural History of the Third Reich which looks at this history, the real history behind the putative supernatural origins or roots of Nazism. And um, I've written on the Holocaust and a number of related topics, German, German relationship to India. So really quite a bit um, from the period of the 1890s to the 1940s related to German and European history. For the audience today, Dr. Kurlander, would you define what is socialism? Great question. Complicated question. Um, my simple answer would be it's a tradition that emerged in the late 18th, early 19th century in France, Scotland, a bit later in Germany, that tried to provide um, an alternative to free market capitalism, which was obviously becoming quite prevalent at that time. It was not inherently revolutionary and it was not inherently violent. Um, many socialists thought you could just build your own community as an alternative to capitalism, such as the utopian socialists. Others thought that capitalism would kind of collapse in and of itself, including to some degree Marx, who thought you had to wait until capitalism had become uh, so advanced and so much of the capital was uh, confined in a, in a select few of the of the wealthy bourgeoisie that it would kind of collapse of, on a, under its own weight with the workers kind of leading uh, the charge for an alternative society, um, which, which he called a communist society. But most socialists were actually quite patient, um, careful, supported democracy, civil rights, um, cosmopolitanism. And um, I think what's confusing for a lot of Americans is that Socialism, while it encompasses all these different intellectual traditions, um, which want to moderate capitalism or eventually replace capitalism, was, was not inherently violent or revolutionary. But when around the turn of the century, when a number of socialists were becoming frustrated with the fact that, you know, the society was still largely capitalist in Europe and America, some of them became more overtly revolutionary. Obviously, Marxist Leninism is all about carrying out the revolution before you've had advanced capitalism and a mass industrial society with a very, very large and organized working class. And during World War I, the frustration of some socialists with that status quo, because they blamed capitalism for the war, led them to carry out violent revolutions. And what ended up happening in the last hundred years is is those socialists who believe that you need to immediately create a communist society through revolution um, tend to refer to themselves as communists. And those socialists or even more mainstream social Democrats who think you need to work within the democratic system 
to to refine capitalism or reform it from within, those tend to be call themselves socialists or social democrats. When you hear the term or the abbreviation, the NSDAP, based on your research, your expertise, and even your imagination, what comes to your mind? I know the provenance of that acronym. It's the National Socialist German Workers Party, right? National Sozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, right? And it was an F to double down on the German Workers' Party, Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, that, that had been created slightly before Hitler joined um, in 1919 and sounded too similar in a lot of ways to some of the left-wing parties that promoted workers' rights or socialism. So they added national to differentiate themselves, right? And then emphasized, you know, we're also socialist, right? National socialist. German Workers' Party. So I, that's what I think about is that initial effort to, to clarify and also double down on certain principles of the early Nazi party. When you think of National Socialism, what comes to your mind? So linked to their name, the National Socialist Party was really an outgrowth of a movement that you see in much of Central Europe, especially Germany and Austria, in the 1880s and 90s, with names like the Christian Social party, the German social party, some of the anti-Semitic parties, which recognized that free market capitalism, which they associated with Jews, many of them, wasn't solving the problems of modernity, of industrial society. On the other hand, Marxist socialism, which they also associated with Jews, seemed to be non-national, non-patriotic, open to all races and creeds in a way that they just could not accept. And so you get a lot of these kind of conservative revolutionaries or right-wing anti-Semitic socially inclined political reformers who form their own parties in the 1880s and 90s, often with the centerpiece being racism and anti-Semitism. The idea that if if somehow the, the Jewish control of society could be eliminated, then Germans or Austrians or other Europeans could get along and kind of do productive work, not eliminate private property, but, but moderate the, the capitalism for the, for the lower middle classes, the small businessman, the farmer. Um, so that's a long tradition in Central Europe, and the Nazis are the heir, heirs to that tradition. They weren't really inventing anything new. Um, And that's, you know, there was even a German social party, a new version of it from the 1880s and 90s and the 1920s that merged with the Nazis eventually. So so that's the tradition. It's this kind of a attempt to split the difference between capitalism and socialism by uniting people around race and ethnicity and language. Right. Instead of left wing Marxism on the one hand or free market you know, Anglo-Saxon liberalism and capitalism on the other, which was also seen as as materialist and Jewish and cosmopolitan, right? If I were to ask you, were the Nazis actually socialists, what would you say? I'd say it's a complicated question because it depends on the time and place that we're talking about. In Munich in 1919, when the party was founded, it was founded by kind of lower middle class um, semi-educated and some some maybe bourgeois um, intellectuals, small businessmen, um, white collar workers who aspired to do what some of the right wing parties had done before the war and gain the support of workers and rural laborers and farmers and and other white collar workers kind of represent the worker, the noble German worker who was losing out. Um, because of the war and because of right um, foreign intervention, and so they wanted they wanted to be a worker dominated party in their program, uh, the 1920 program that Hitler co-authored. They make a, n- a number of um, claims, right? Their platform that sound vaguely socialistic about regulating the power of the banks and helping out, you know, subsidies for farmers and things like that. But even at that stage, in their most kind of early rudimentary, maybe you could say radical stage, 
they were very careful about suggesting they wanted to eliminate private property, work with other labor parties in Germany or elsewhere on the left. Um, they were skeptical towards unions and they admired hard work and, and you know, the productive work um, that they associated with Aryan ingenuity, right? So, you know, from the very beginning, they, they were not anti-capitalist so much as they were skeptical of free market, big business um, oriented capitalism. And on the one hand, and the what they saw as Marxist international Judeo Bolshevism on the other, but there were definitely socialistic elements. And, and if you were a traditional conservative or a free market liberal in the early twenties, one of the things you would say about the Nazi party is that while it was relatively incoherent, there were these socialist radical elements, which, which seemed to undermine um, the, the general um, consensus around capitalism as the best form of, of economic organization. And for our audience today who may not be familiar with this, the Nazi party, especially under the guidance of Hitler, establishes what they call the 25 points. Would you mind giving us a brief explanation as to what the 25 points are, but also after decades of scholarship on this subject, some works being more dated than others, how accurate is that? What were the 25 points overall, and did the Nazis keep it or abandon it? Why don't I start with a brief summary of the scholarship? Okay, so the scholarship on Nazism, and I won't get into the entire period of the Third Reich, let's just say up to coming to power. Um, on one hand, you have Marxist interpretations that go back to the 1930s that say whatever their rhetoric and their rhetoric, just like Mussolini's often sounded radical and revolutionary, they were always a party that was indebted to the lower middle classes, to people who viewed themselves as and eventually were fueled by big business, that without big business backing them, along with the lower middle classes, they never would have taken power. And the reason is they represented the bulwark against the left, against unions, communism, socialism, urban working classes, modernity um, in its most diverse and problematic form, if you're a conservative. So while the relationship, Marxists would say, between Traditional conservatives and fascists was never um, perfectly seamless. Nazism was really a radical form of right-wing conservatism, the last gasp of monopoly capitalism, trying to protect itself when it no longer represented a majority of the population. Okay, That's one tradition. So whatever they say in their program at any point, they are there to protect capital, private property, destroy the left. Um, persecute ethnic minorities, close the border, prevent foreigners from getting in. All these things you associate with kind of traditional conservatism or right-wing kind of traditionalism. On the other hand, you have a revisionist um, argument, often made by conservative historians, but not only conservative historians, that Nazism was actually a left wing in many respects and fascism in general, also Mussolini's movement. Mussolini had been a socialist. Goebbels had been a socialist. Hitler had flirted with socialism, was actually a left wing movement. And the only real innovation is that it wanted to organize itself nationally instead of internationally. And so for those historians, uh, Henry Turner is a famous example of this. Um, big business was always skeptical of them. The churches were always skeptical. And if anything, they had more in common with uh, the left and far left in their, you know, the, the uniforms, the mass movement, the criticism of free market capitalism and tradition, the revolutionary aspects um, than they ever did with the, with the conservative, traditional conservative right. And if you want a kind of simplistic way of seeing this in an American context, take totalitarianism theory. Right. There are still a lot of Americans around, mostly conservatives, who don't understand and don't see any difference between the Soviet Union and the Third Reich or, or Mao's China. They're just all totalitarian societies, which is why they don't know how to use the term communism or fascism. Right. Because for them, it's just not American. Right. It's not this belief in, in freedom, 
and representative government and private property. When in reality, obviously, the Soviet Union and the Third Reich hated each other and tried to destroy each other. And the communists and, and fascists were killing each other in the streets. But the simplified version of that theory is that whatever they claim about being distinct, that's just another version of left-wing totalitarianism, right? So that's a very general view of, the, of, of two different approaches. And I'd say most approaches since the 70s and 80s are in between. Most approaches recognize that there were both elements within the Nazi party and its platform and its policies, even after 33, that we would call, I don't want to, I don't know if I should use the term progressive, but interventionist, interest, welfare, right? Um, subsidies for people who had, you know, more than one child, universal health care, right? Which, of course, even Bismarck supported to some extent. Most modern states, conservative, liberal, or otherwise, support the welfare state, but they weren't anti welfare. And then there are very conservative elements like uh, wanting women to be at home producing children and um, preferring that people rely on more traditional values and aesthetics and mythology and, and the German past rather than this kind of futuristic, um, urban, diverse, multicultural vision that they associate with the Weimar Republic. So I'm, I'm simplifying here, but I would say most historians that get anything published now would recognize this traditional Marxist view and would also rec recognize the kind of conservative response to that view and say there, those are both in interesting interpretations, but neither holds water if you look at the complexity of the Nazi movement. So with that as context, the 25 points are a kind of model of how fascists viewed the world coming out of World War I. Fascists were really trying to create an alternative to the three dominant schools of thought politically uh, by the end of the 19th century, right? On the left, you had socialism and liberalism, and on the right, you had conservatism. And the fascists were trying to draw, whether they admitted it or not, on all three. So if you go through the 25 points, on the one hand, you've got things about, we believe in you know, freedom of conscience, uh, conscience and religious freedom, unless you're Jewish, of course, then we don't like it, which sounds very liberal, separation of church and state. Then you have something about ending interest slavery of the big banks. Well, that sounds like socialism. And then you have stuff about family values and tradition and, you know, preserving the family. And that sounds conservative. So you can go through it and you can see written out the complete incoherence of fascism as a doctrine, right? What held fascism together was not anything positive it wanted to do, but really what it didn't like and what it told people they should be against. And it, it was kind of a grab bag of those three traditions. Now, different fascist movements, I'd argue that Franco, if we call Franco fascism, he ended up allying more with traditional Catholic conservatism Mussolini for a time maybe erred more on the side of socialism. Nazism kind of quintessentially seemed to go between those at different times, though I think ultimately it became more radicalized, not so much in the social welfare aspect, but in its idea of, of carrying out a racial revolution and a total war, right, which was not very conservative. Um, so that program, while it would evolve over time and they would abandon certain elements, double down on others, is pretty much what you would expect a fascist party to say they were for, which is kind of everything at once and nothing in particular um, coming out of, you know, World War One, if that if that helps. And so one of the common aspects that you see pop up in discussions about the Nazis their funding, and their party support is big business. And so I want to bring that up here and ask, how much was big business linked to the Nazi party? Excellent question. Right. So um, as I noted, there are, there are historians who would claim that the party in its most successful incarnation after it re was refounded when prison was very much a middle class party allied with business, both lower middle class, small business and upper middle class, heavy industry and light industry. Um, and because that was a very powerful assumption on in left wing and some kind of, let's say, progressive liberal interpretations, a number of historians in the 70s and 80s kind of uh, 
delved in more deeply and showed that while some big business um, big businessmen like uh, Fritz Tusen, right, and the Krupp family did eventually back Hitler before, and I'm not saying just instrumentally, right, before they took power, gave significant contributions, e- even in some cases joined the party. Um, the majority of heavy industry and certainly light industry, which was more focused on exports and therefore international trade. And this is an important point to make. Um, heavy industry, which fuels the military industrial complex, often gets government contracts, right? And governments often want to rely on their own heavy industry to produce certain things. So you'll notice that heavy industry tends to be more organized capitalist, more conservative, um, less dependent on free trade, more or less over the last hundred years, not just in Germany, but elsewhere, and therefore more allied with conservative forces in the government or ultimately with the Nazis who wanted to rebuild the military. Light industry, which tends to be more uh, free trade oriented, synthetic, back then it would be synthetics, finished goods, consumer products, things like, um, like Robert Bosch, right? Bosch is still around. Um, high-end engineering, electrical, right? IA gay. They're a little more skeptical of heavy industry and these kind of alliances with the government and want more free trade. So why am I giving you that context? Because many, many of the liberal businessmen who traditionally supported free trade were more skeptical initially of the Third Reich than heavy industry was. Tucson and Krupp, you know, arms producers, it makes sense. I'm trying to explain why they may have been more willing to go with a party that promised to, you know, rearm even more aggressively than the conservative parties they had traditionally supported said they would. But long story short, the Nazis scared conservatives a little bit. Um, with their radicalism, both the violence in the streets, the uniforms, the um, at least vaguely anti-capitalist slogans, until the late 20s, 30s, when Hitler very consciously and and a lot of the Nazi uh, leadership made an effort to tone down that kind of rhetoric and and highlight their anti-Bolshevism and anti-communism and right protecting capital or private property against the left preventing a socialist revolution and conservatives on the other hand, realizing they had no constituency left the middle-class parties that the parties that voted for conservatives since the 1850s and sixties and maybe 12 or 15%, 20% of the electorate and the rest of the middle classes, lower middle class, upper middle class who tended to vote for the two or three liberal parties since the 1850s or sixties at 25 or 30% combined almost a majority, right? They had dropped after the depression, the first election after the depression to about a combined, you know, eight or 10% of the vote. So they knew they couldn't form a government. And while the liberals held out a little bit longer, not wanting to ally with fascism, the conservatives at that point were like, well, we need, we need a movement. It's not going to be the left. If we've got to make a deal with someone, it's going to be the right. So that a number of conservative leaders met with Hitler in 31 the Hartsburg Front was formed. Hitler himself refused to kind of commit to anything, wanting to preserve his autonomy and the radicalism of his movement. But it was pretty clear between the mid 20s and the early 30s that the Nazi Party, whatever its rhetoric, was getting its votes from lower middle class business owners, white collar workers, farmers, and then after 1930, increasingly from the upper middle classes and businessmen. That does not mean there was a one relationship, but clearly if you had to say who did big business support by the early 30s, they much preferred Nazism to socialism or communism, and they knew that there was no future for the liberal and conservative parties. In the work, The German Dictatorship by Brocker, he brings up that one terminology used for the Third Reich was an authoritarian capitalist monopoly. In your opinion, is that too simplistic? Let me tie this into the historiographical debates real quick. Brocker is one of the few really well-known historians of the 50s and 60s. And like Shire, remember, he's the kind of the first generation of post-war historians, clearly still being read by um, 
by your viewers, but he's one of the few who already got it in terms of the complexity of this. So while he was center right, probably politically, and certainly not sympathetic to communism, in that one regard, he recognized the ways in which the Marxists were right, that Nazism at the end of the day was a particularly violent, vociferous, aggressively imperialist form of organized capitalism, the kind that Lenin warned about during World War I, right? That in order to sustain itself, it needed to both exploit people at home, workers at home, but because it needed the support of workers, and and in the case of Nazism, they were technically Aryans, right? So you didn't want to eliminate them. You also needed to find resources abroad, capital, food, markets, cheap labor. And so when Brocker calls it an authoritarian capitalist monopoly, he's not wrong that at its certainly by the late 30s, when the rearmament push was was going on very strongly and they were directly allied with heavy industry to produce certain things, there were controls on what resources needed to be brought in you know, not to lose um, foreign exchange, right? Um, Because there was during the depression and Germany was just coming out of it. But at the same time, you know, not wanting to to end capitalism, right? They were trying, there was, it was a very organized authoritarian capitalism, which, which made profits for heavy industry and did increase wages for workers, but was also heavily controlled, um, not pro free market. And in fact, um, one of the big debates in the mid thirties was between the at least um, formerly liberal finance minister, a guy named Yalmar Schacht, who during the Weimar Republic had helped um, refound the Reichsmark and stabilize the currency. And right along with Gustav Stresemann, another liberal who was chancellor at the time, he had been Hitler's finance minister and Reichsbank, Reichsbank president for a while. And again, there's partly an answer to your question. He hires this bourgeois, liberal, pro-capitalist uh, uh, banker, that's how socialist can you be if that's the guy you put in charge of both the, the bank, right, and your economy. But there did, there did emerge some issues because Chuck said, okay, we've been rearming for a few years with something he called the new plan, which wasn't that different from the New Deal um, in America. Government or deficit financed uh, production primarily in the military, but also also infrastructure to get people back to work. And of course, Hitler and Goering were happy to rebuild the military, so they liked it. But then around 36, Hitler started to say, you know, this isn't going fast enough. Too much of our production is going into consumer products and exports, and yet we're surrounded by enemies and a war could break out at any time. You know, typical Hitler rhetoric. Yeah, you, you're probably going to be the one to cause it, but he used passive voice. So we need a four-year plan that focuses more of our resources on guns and not butter. And shocked, good liberal economists said, but wait, now that that deficit financing worked for a while, why don't we gradually reintegrate ourselves, as Germany's always been good at, as an export-oriented economy in the free market, right? And, and also make sure that all these workers working so hard with higher and higher wages have something to buy, like consumer products. We don't want runaway inflation. We don't want everything, you know, be focused on capital goods. But Hitler and Goering said, no, we're not thrilled with that. We want to focus on producing for the military in an organized way and basically um, directing resources where we want them. And in that sense, that is organized monopoly or authoritarian capitalism, right? That is not free market liberal capitalism. And that's what Brocker was getting at what many Marxists already in the 30s and 40s, that this is just an aggressive, advanced form of organized capitalism. And again, it's not anything that Marx envisioned or that socialists were pushing for, even if the command elements, right, especially during the war, are similar to any capitalist economy at war. The command elements were there in the United States. They were there in Great Britain, again, with a conservative government, right? And you saw it in the Soviet Union. But we need to be careful about saying, well, because of these command elements, Hitler was really a socialist. Um, as Brocker rightly points out, it was still, it was an organized capitalism. And so let's talk economy. In many ways, economy can, in a way, help define 
a culture, society, civilization, empire. And so my question is, was the economy of the Third Reich a capitalist economy? The short answer is yes, but it was a mixed economy. Like virtually all economies in the industrialized world by the 1930s. And because, as I mentioned earlier, there was a great awareness that austerity and government non intervention, which is a little unfair. Uh, Heinrich Brüning, uh, one of the last chancellors of the Weimar Republic, did recognize he needed to, to intervene in some ways by 1932. He was not a kind of Hooverian, you know, hands off, let's just cut expenditures and see what happens kind of guy. Um, but pretty much everyone, and think about it, Keynes was able to get um, a hearing with the conservative governments of the mid to late 30s in Britain, even though he was left of center. Roosevelt, an elitist New England, you know, moderate Democrat committed to a, you know, relatively um, interventionist, some would say socialistic response. So it was a capitalist economy that made concessions to the state in order to fuel growth and employment and kind of manage the challenges of, of the Great Depression. But in that sense, it was not much different than the United States or Great Britain, whether run by left of center Democrats or right of center, you know, conservatives like Chamberlain and Churchill. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't use the elements, as I just pointed out, Jalmar Schacht, who was running the economy, was a free market liberal before the Great Depression and also agreed to this new plan, which was more of a, of a command approach. So um, it was the capitalist economy that was making the kinds of concessions and innovations that Keynes and others recommended um, in order to negotiate the Depression. It was not coming from the socialist side, making concessions to the free market. It was quite the opposite. When many people think of socialism, a lot of times they'll envision nationalized industries or sectors. And so I want to talk about that now. And so did the Nazis nationalize certain industries? Were there some that they didn't nationalize? And was that nationalization different from, let's say, what occurred in the USSR? Right. Great question. So in general, they did not nationalize industry. In fact, what I, I would argue what the Nazis did was a kind of neo version of what the German economy was already doing in the 19th century to fuel the second industrial revolution, which is uh, they had what joint stock companies where uh, a bank that would be investing, let's say, in a, in a company that produced railroads or armaments would have members of that bank on the board of the company it was investing in and vice versa, that members of that company would sit on the board of the bank and then maybe their government official who was on the board or sat in ex officio, right? It was a kind of organized capitalism. And I think that's the probably the best way to describe uh, the Third Reich. They very much left the um, heavy industry, light industry, um, to their own devices insofar as they were in charge of their um, corporations, but the Nazis did try to get them to join the party or get party members put on the board or, you know, use the government to invest or incentivize the production uh, in certain industries, especially military production. So I wouldn't say there was no mass nationalization of industry in the Third Reich, but there were definitely partnerships, which were not unusual in the Kaiser Reich or in Weimar between the private sector and the public sector, which may seem odd to um, Anglo-American observers. That would, it, was, it's, it was more organized than we were used to, but not, not in the course of German history, I would say even in France, and definitely not what they were doing in the Soviet Union. And so let's talk social programs. A lot of people, when they think of socialism, they tend to think of a variety of different things, usually involving a government program. We know that realistically, from the Bronze Age to today, everyone from tribal societies to small city-states, civilizations, and later empires had some form of program that could be described as socialistic, whether it was grain distribution or housing. And so my question is, when we look at the Third Reich and possibly socialist government programs, was it any different from, let's say, its European or even American neighbors? So obviously, every country has slight variations in how they 
determine where to intervene in the private sector, right? Um, famously, in order to prevent the rise of socialism, because Germany had the largest socialist party um, by the 1880s in Europe, um, uh, the most people who explicitly were members of the socialist party and Bismarck even passed an anti-socialist bill, which kind of infringed on their civil rights. But as a, as a counterpoise to that, to get the workers on his side, and there's a reason I'm giving you this context, he also passed some of the first social legislation creating a modern welfare state, unemployment insurance, health insurance, um, disability insurance, right, in the 1880s. He didn't do it because as a conservative aristocrat, he believed in handouts or socialism. He hated socialism. He did it and he convinced even some conservatives and some free market liberals to vote for it as a way of heading off the left. That if you want a society that functions, you want to preserve you know, the, the private sector, capital, natural inequality, we need something here that deals with the problems of industrialization right? Because people are losing their arms. They do get fired, hired and fired relatively at whim. So we need unemployment insurance, right? Um, it didn't ter- it did terribly well. The socialists kept growing. The unions got bigger uh, throughout the 1890s. Um, and by, you know, the turn of the century, socialism was getting the most votes and, the mo- and had the most um, representatives. Well, fast forward to Weimar or the Third Reich, there's a, there's a robust understanding, and this is true of most of continental Western Europe, right, Central Europe, that the welfare state, if, if modest and if aimed at certain goals, is fine, right? It just, ha- it just um, I think it took a bit longer in America and Great Britain, though. By the 30s, you know, you have William Beveridge, a free market liberal, and Keynes, right, already recommending certain kinds of interventions. And then you get the beverage report during World War II, which is the foundation of the modern British welfare state. So the, the Germans were a little bit ahead of the curve, but, it, but the right had been, had been fueling that as much as any, anyone on the left. And so when the Nazis came in and created, you know, modest forms of universal health care, a family loan program that the more kids, so you would get money when you got married. And then the more kids you had, I think four was the cutoff. You wouldn't have to repay any of the loans. So, you know, 25% was defrayed with one kid, 50% with the next. And that's a direct welfare payment, right? The joy through work program, um, the idea that workers should be given um, subsidies, to both improve their life in the workplace, but also fund vacations and subsidized by the state or co- co-subsidized with the, with the business. Um, these are all ways in their mind of, of keeping workers happy and heading off any more radical interventions and, and also fueling the production. And this is something I should mention. One of the arguments that came out in the sixties, a few historians, David Schoenbaum, to some degree, um, Ralph Darendorf, is that while the Nazis never did carry out a social revolution fueled by kind of Marxist um, theory, because of their obsession with race and because they wanted to create paths for normal people who were in their minds racially superior to, you know, kind of replace Jews and liberals and and naysayers and, and cosmopolitans eventually through, you know, new kinds of schools, the Hitler youth, eliminating so many of those people from the economy. Remember, Jews were 30, 25, 30 percent of the doctors, lawyers, professors, right? They did create a kind of social revolution through their racism and their obsession with the Volksgemeinschaft. And some of that was through government intervention too, right? Giving subsidies or benefits to certain people over others. They also subsidized uh, agriculture for a while until they decided it was too costly and they preferred to subsidize, you know, rearmament. So I'm, I'm bringing up a lot of things here, but they were socialistic in some of these ways, but in ways that parallel other continental European countries and eventually Britain and America. And so when it comes to the legacy of the Third Reich, Nazism, National Socialism, Let's talk revisionism at this point. How has academia evolved on this subject? 
as I mentioned earlier, the the extreme kind of poles of the historiography, one that Nazism is just a radical form of right wing conservatism that wants to protect capitalism and big business from left wing revolution. No one is really arguing that anymore. And we also don't really have a traditional conservative historiographical school anymore that says, oh, you know, Nazism is just another version of left wing totalitarianism. What we have are a number of variations in between that emphasize things like their, like the role of the racial state or biopolitics or competing interests within the Nazi party that you had kind of the bourgeois SS um, who increasingly got control and wanted to profit from Nazism and set up you know, industries in the East and were wealthier and more capitalist. And then the lower middle class or working class Nazis organized in the stormtroopers who got increasingly marginalized because they wanted a second revolution, which never happened. In fact, their leadership was killed by Hitler and Himmler because they didn't want a left wing, you know, national Bolshevism. So um, I think most interpretations now recognize like, like other capitalist economies in the 30s and during the war, Nazism ported a mix of capitalism and, and state intervention uh, that supported their ends, that kept them popular, that kept workers happy, that fueled the, the, um, their military ambitions. And no one right now, I think, in, as an academic, would make a strong case on the one hand that they were socialist in the way that actual socialists are socialist or communists. On the other hand, no one would deny that they had elements like they're not traditionally conservative, right? Um, so, you know, they obviously were interventionist and radical and had revolutionary elements that don't fit into the idea that they're just this right wing capitalist, you know, vehicle for traditional conservatism. And as we cover the evolution of academic thought on this subject, I would also like to ask, can we classify the Nazis as conservative or even the extreme right? And let me answer that. As we discussed briefly during the break, there is a tradition since the 1890s in Europe um, and the United States as well. If you go back to the Klan or William F. Pelley in the 30s in his silver shirts of radical right or alt-right um, politics, which is equally frustrated with what they perceive as the left, socialism, unions, international Marxism, and what they would view as a traditional Anglo-Saxon conservatism based in liberalism, right, or libertarianism, free markets, separation of powers, constitutions, individual rights, civil rights, open markets, right, open borders. And that alt-right movement has waxed and waned depending on the international situation. It, it exploded in the 1880s and 90s as a reaction to the Civil War and to the rise of big business, right, as an alternative to left-wing critiques of modern industrial capitalism. It exploded again in the 20s and 30s in America and elsewhere. We saw Father Coughlin and, and the Pelly and the Silver Shirts, right? And it's also since the late 90s and early 2000s as a reaction, I would argue, to neoliberalism, things like NAFTA, mass immigration, it's exploded again. It is not Reagan conservatism or Buckley traditionalism. It is not free market liberalism. It's, it's why, if you're looking at the right end of the political spectrum, these, these groups, whether Marine Le Pen's National Front or some of these groups in the United States, I mean, we could talk about QAnon and some of these groups that are kind of um, uncritical supporters of, of Trump. I wouldn't put Trump in this, but I think some of these supporters are. They don't like the Republican establishment because the Republican establishment is conservative. And conservatism, you know, to the degree that it still supports constitution, separation of powers, the deep state, free market capitalism, individual rights, civil rights, is not something that excites these groups. So in that sense, it would be unfair to call the Nazi party conservative because it's part of this alt-right tradition. Now, what, what makes that important is those today who think that the Republican party is one thing have to recognize the Republican party has traditional conservatives, including libertarians, neoliberals, 
kind of Christian evangelicals. And it has this alt-right constituency, which is a, a viable alternative to the modern Western status quo. It has been since the 1890s. It can be more or less racist and protectionist and frustrated with open borders, more or less capitalist or, or interventionist, wanting in handouts, you know, preserving my jobs, but not others. Um, but it's been there for over 100 years. And it's not traditionally conservative. And we just need to be fair in recognizing that tradition and also fair for people on the left who want to, you know, dismiss the Republican Party or conservatives as as being somehow far right or fascist, recognize that there's a very long tradition of conservatism in America and Britain and continental Europe, which is not for closing the borders, ending immigration, destroying individual rights or civil rights, preventing free trade, right? And I think people need to, to, to think about today, whether they're in the Netherlands, France, or America, do they like traditional conservatism? Do they believe in the constitution, separation of powers, free market capitalism, civil rights, or do they find open borders more or less, not open, but not completely controlled with walls and security and cages, right? And if they don't like that, then think about what makes them conservative. Because I wouldn't want to dismiss conservatism, this really important tradition in the West, by by labeling it alt-right or fascist. The Nazis were not, in that sense, traditionally conservative, nor would I say the alt-right traditionally conservative. Um, and I'm trying to be careful. I'm not saying that anyone who who's alt-right or a Trump supporter is a fascist, but it's a different approach to criticizing the so-called left than a traditional conservative would, which is just, I don't really like welfare, but we can agree on constitutions. And there's a lot of common ground between conservatives, liberals, and the moderate left in Europe and most countries about the ground rules. And I think those ground rules are really called into question on the far right and far left as they were in the 20s and 30s. Dr. Kurlander, you have taken us through this fascinating and complex topic in such a way that provided great insight but it's easy for people from academics to novices like myself to really grasp what you're talking about. And so I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your guidance. And honestly, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you, Nick. This was a pleasure. And uh, you're hardly a novice. And I'm, I'm really uh, interested in, in how your viewers uh, um, you know, get involved in this conversation going forward. It's a really important one. Our next guest is a personal favorite. And I can't recommend his channel enough. He is going to give us a thorough breakdown on his take of not just socialism and how we view it today, but also how he views the Nazi party and the Third Reich and its supposed connection to socialism itself. And so, without further ado, I present Dr. Czar of History and Headlines. On February 24, 1920, the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, German Workers' Party, or DAP, changed its name to the National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, with the word socialist being added by the party's executive committee over Adolf Hitler's objections in order to help appeal to left-wing workers. Today, History and Headlines takes a look at a frequently asked question. Were the Nazis actually socialists? Does their very name mean anything? With their official party's name being National Socialist German Workers' Party, in English, or more precisely, National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterparty in the original German, one could easily infer that, as the name implies, the Nazi party espouses a socialist platform and philosophy. But is this designation indeed the case? Before we can answer the question, we have to agree upon a definition of what socialism is and who socialists are. Today we hear the word socialist thrown around as an accusation in American politics with varying degrees of accuracy and inaccuracy. So it's best to understand what that particular form of governance really is. We find the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition to be as follows. 1. Any of various economic and political theories 
advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. Two, a system of society or group living in which there is no private property or a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. And three, a stage of society in Marxist theory transitional between capitalism and communism and distinguished by unequal distribution of goods and pay according to work done. Reading this dictionary definition, we can quickly ascertain that a critical element in the definition of socialism is that private property and private commercial industry is non-existent, that all property is of the collective of the people, and all industry is owned by the state, or in effect by the population at large, instead of private shareholders or owners. The writings of Karl Marx are the foundation for what the academic understanding of socialism is, and those writings can easily be consulted in order to clear up any misunderstandings of the definition and description of a socialist state. Another way of looking at the definition and common understanding of what socialism is can be derived by examining how people today understand the concept in a colloquial way. In this manner, we have a more liberal definition of socialism, or at least in socialist tendencies, based on not the iron-bound rigid prohibition against private property, but a more composite society where both private property and capitalism exist in a framework also characterized by massive government programs that take the traditional role formerly filled by private enterprise. Such endeavors would include socialized medicine, where all the citizens of a country or other political division would have government-provided health care and or insurance, and government monopolies on vital services such as utilities. The greater extent of government ownership of production and of energy, natural resources, hard goods and services, as well as government being intricately involved in rules and regulations governing other aspects of daily life are an indication of the level of socialism present in the system being examined. We hear references to Scandinavian countries as being allegedly socialist because of their high levels of government-provided services and constraints on their people, including education, health care, work rules, retirement pensions, and heavy taxation to pay for all this government-provided largesse. Yet these countries, as most other industrialized nations, also have a thriving private industrial base. Other countries, now numbering in the extreme few, cling to communist ideals of socialism, including China, Vietnam, and Cuba, although China especially has demonstrated a serious breach of communist doctrine by opening up a certain level of capitalist activity. Few, if any, of the countries today can measure up to the strict dictionary definition of socialism, though we seem happy enough to refer to many European model nations as socialists, and of course label the few remaining communist nations as socialists. By our colloquial definition, the United States is called by some observers to be a socialist country, while in fact we retain a vast array of private property ownership and privately owned businesses with no national universal health care or retirement system. Oh wait, we do have Social Security, a partial retirement fund, and Medicare Medicaid, a program of health insurance coverage for elderly and poor people. Yet, we also have no national government-owned electric company or government monopoly on natural resources. You may note that many countries have nationalized their oil and other natural resources, taking those resources out of the hands of private enterprise. Although many other government programs such as work regulations, corporate average fuel economy standards, the Environmental Protection Agency, and even seemingly normal services such as police and fire protection, maintenance of streets and highways, and many other aspects of daily life can all be and are often described as socialist programs. We do not generally consider the United States to be a socialist country, 
At least, not yet. So, where in this continuum of capitalism, free reign versus socialism, does the Third Reich land? Certainly, under the Nazi rule from 1933 to 1945, the German government became intrusive into the lives of their population in a major way. Trade unions, a bastion of freedom for the working class, were banned in Nazi Germany, with the state taking over the role of looking out for the welfare of the workers. Of course, this premise was a sham, with the government using working people as if they were serfs from an earlier day, slave labor forced to work for substandard wages on government projects. This sort of nationalism of the workers can be construed to be a hallmark of socialism. Much has been made politically over the fact that the Germans were the ones who first instituted a form of social security, supposedly a model followed by the United States. Government projects, construction, industrial, and social became a large part of everyday life for the German population, and democracy became a casualty to national socialism, as the Nazis often called their system. One could easily ask, how can the people truly own their government in the absence of real democracy? We believe this question is indeed legitimate. Furthermore, German industrial concerns and private ownership remained throughout the Nazi period, even in the darkest days of World War II as the country was collapsing. Profits making certain capitalists rich and richer never went out of style in Nazi Germany. Enormous capitalist firms such as Daimler-Benz, Porsche, Krupp, defunct as of 1999, Henschel, which became wholly consumed by Mercedes-Benz in the 1990s, Hugo Boss, Messerschmitt, absorbed in corporate mergers in 1989, Falkel Wolf, absorbed in mergers in 1954, Volkswagen, which now owns at least eight car manufacturing companies, including German and foreign companies, as well as motorcycle and heavy vehicle manufacturers, Bayer and IG Farben, officially liquidated in 2012, although... Some of its subsidiaries, such as Bayer, remain in business. Among others, survived the war to continue as industrial powerhouses after the Second World War and Nazi era had ended. In fact, one of the criticisms of the German war effort during World War II was that the national government did not nationalize all industry and take production out of private hands. The Germans and their national socialist government failed to go the extra mile to truly socialize the war production effort, while private investors and entrepreneurs continued to reap great wealth. While the post-war banking industry was largely controlled by the central government bank, initially the Bank Deutscher Lander, BDL, and later the Bundesbank, the Nazi-era bankers were to a great extent intimately involved in the operations of the new national banking system. Thus, we can safely answer our topic question, were the Nazis actually socialists, in the negative. No, they were not socialists, although the Nazi government of Germany certainly did take greater than previous control of many aspects of everyday life for the German people. The wide-ranging continuation of capitalist investment, contracts, production, and trade are antithetical to what we consider socialism. Like many countries today, Nazi Germany was really more of a composite society with aspects of capitalism and private ownership and intrusive government involvement in the workings of society, though we would hesitate to compare the Third Reich to the modern United States or countries of the European Union. As a question for my students and subscribers, was the Third Reich actually a socialist society? please let us know in the comments section below this video. If you liked my response in this video and would like to receive notification of new videos by me, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines and become one of our patrons. Your viewership is much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the next segment of Were the Nazis Actually Socialists? As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, but today we are joined by a very special guest, another YouTube historian, and that is none other than Aster from Tipsy Fish History. Aster, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. When it comes to the Nazi party, based on history, your research, and even your imagination, when you think of the Nazis and national socialism, what is it that really comes first to your mind? 
gradual intolerance, intolerance of anything that they deem not a part of their group. It's not based on any form of hierarchy or social commentary. It's merely a case of how are we able to control people? How are we able to divide people and to have groups of individuals fight one another while we gain power? The ideology behind it is nothing but destructive. And there's a lot of folks that would like to tap into that same sort of thing. It has a lot of aspects in terms of modern politics that can create a rise of a Nazi party or a similar one. Um, and it's, it's a very dangerous thing when you de- dig more deep into it because anyone's susceptible to it and they may not even realize it. Oftentimes when we think of the Nazi party, we think of fascism, but I want to shift this directly to national socialism. When you think of national socialism, what does it bring to your mind? National socialism is a mixture of populism and nationalism. And there is overlap between the two ideological poles. Uh, populism has nationalist overtones. Nationalism has populism overtones. But in the end, if we're referring directly to the Nazi party, and we're talking about specifically national socialism, the first thing that comes to my mind is they marketed themselves well. They marketed themselves in a way just based by the name that it's not who they are, but they were able, they were able to brand themselves in a way that appealed to people and they had a messaging that appealed to people in a way that very few others were able to replicate. And in the end, as we know, it was very destructive what they used with that appeal. In my previous question, you answered and talked about how the Nazi party excelled in marketing themselves to a variety of different individuals and including some people that normally wouldn't have went along with it to begin with. And so my question is, this episode revolves around a single word, and that is socialism. And so my question is, as they marketed that within their party name, do you actually consider the Nazis to be socialists? Absolutely not. Not even close. <laughs> the uh, it'd be it'd be kind. It's kind of the the same situation with North Korea. They're called the Northern Democratic Republic of Korea. They are not democratic. It's just a marketing ploy in the name. That's all it is. When it comes to the Nazi Party, do you really consider them to be? conservative in nature, or is it a little more complicated than that? It really depends on how you define conservatism. Um, the Nazi party in general, it's, God, it's, it's very difficult to really pinpoint a conservative ideology. You can say that they're a far-right ideology, and conservatism is within that sphere, but they weren't so much in the vein of traditionalists like you had in other right-wing movements, such as the Action Francais in France, uh, which has actually seen a revival. The longest-running French party uh, is seeing a revival in modern politics. Um, and it was more a mixture of where they were able to take some levels of ideological ideas while also taking some more nuanced and almost revolutionary or more kind of underlying left-wing policies, and they mixed it together in a way where they filled a niche that wasn't really filled by anyone else in Germany at the time. And so when it comes to the Nazi movement, a question I wanted to ask you specifically is what set the Nazi movement apart from a variety of other movements going on during this time period? The, the biggest thing to consider with Germany at the time is that in reality, you had a significant political parties were essentially new in Germany at the time. They did exist uh, from the 1860s onward from the, from the unification of the German states. They existed in some form. Um, but after their defeat in World War I and the establishment of the Weimar Republic, you didn't really have long-established political parties. A lot of them were created in 1919, 1920, but most of them were short-lived. 
And you had various communist ones. You had socialist ones. You had Marxist ones. You had, uh, you know, center ones. You had, you know, right-leaning ones, you didn't really have a super far-right faction. Um, you did have one that existed from 1922 to 1924 that was actually a proto-Nazi party in direct competition, um, but they fell in 24 and they ended up being absorbed into the National Socialist Party. Um, but the biggest thing was that what happened was that they were able to be very vocal in localized elections and that and in germany you had still regional powers almost that you know one party that was super successful in say saxony wouldn't be successful in um in bremen and you'd have one in bavaria that would be successful there but not somewhere else and that allows them to get a very solid base of support without having to necessarily compete with other parties at the same time. And that was one of the reasons that the Nazis were able to get a bit of a foothold while other parties sort of collapsed. Um, the One of the largest ones that they ended up taking, that the Nazis took a lot from, was the German National People's Party. I'm not going to try to pronounce it in German. My German is not that good. Um, <laughs> but they were essentially a coalition between center-left groups, moderate groups, centrist groups, and right-wing groups. So you had monarchists, you had anti-French, you had you know, people that want to work within the Versailles system, you had people that didn't want to work in the Versailles system that were all competing within the, within one under one party label. And as the Nazis gained in power, they were able to gradually take some of the more right-wing uh, sections of that party away because, well, you can't keep a huge tent like that in very particular ways. Um, and they end up becoming uncontested in terms of that ideological pull. There was no alternate right-wing party really in Germany. So they were able to just gobble up the people that were like that. And then when the Great Depression hit, uh, Germany had been coming out, had been having an economic recovery in the late 20s. And that was through American loans. That was through the French not being, you know, not occupying the Ruger Valley um, and the Belgians not occupying it. Um, and there was a lot of uh, diplomacy that was being made on the Versailles front to give them greater access to lesser debt payments, having their more natural resources come up. And that would have completely destroyed the populist angle that the Nazis were going for. But because you had such a huge crash in 1929, 1930 in Germany, you had a significant amount of people that were, well, now out of work and significantly poor. And that's where the Nazis' pro uh, populist agenda, where they talked about, you know, the almost the superiority of the German people really kind of resonated within, you know, with those lower class folk. I don't like to use the word lower class, but lower class. Um, and it gave them a lot of popular power because they went, we can fix this. We know what to do. We know what the problem is. And it's Jewish people. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but it works. It works because they are able to target a minority that's already oppressed to blame the problems on. Um, and you had that. Like, uh, if you're to look at the propaganda when the French end up occupying the, Ru the Ruger bit in 1923, what did the German right wing primarily attack? They attacked the French as Jewish. They attacked the French as they attacked the colonial troops for being black. And it built a lot of support behind it because you were able to get people to rally behind a cause like that. Um, and then once they had the people in the populist angle, they were able to swing them more over towards nationalism, talking about how Germany is better. Germany is true, um, which it's a very similar to populism, but it's more populism is more talking about the people themselves. Nationalism is talking about the state. And there just wasn't an alternative for that same sort of 
party, that same sort of ideology within Germany at the time, there wasn't an alternative. Everything was more to the left of them in terms of ideological pull. And they were so busy infighting one another that they didn't have the ability to stop that rise. We've briefly been guided into a very interesting story as another YouTube historian has brought us through their view of the past, and that is the complexity of the Nazi movement, what separated it from other movements during its time, which eventually worked to its benefit. And so, Aster, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And thank you very much for having me. I super appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, today on this episode, and we are joined by none other than Cypher from The Cynical Historian. Cypher, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm sure it's going to be fun. Based on your research and your imagination, when you hear the phrase, the Third Reich, what goes through your mind? A bunch of movies, basically colorized Lenny Riefenstahl clips. And World War II, of course, and the Holocaust. And so as we talk about the Third Reich, we naturally will think of the Nazi party and the Nazis who made up this party that would really forever change history as we know it. And so my question is, when you hear the term Nazi, what do you envision? Well, a member of the Nazi party, of course, but also I also tend to think of like neo-Nazis in that, which that neo is actually doing a lot of work. From some guy at Charlottesville carrying a Nazi flag to, um, you know, Hitler himself, all of that comes through my mind, at least. So it's very easy to, to associate the actual Nazis with neo-Nazis. Question on whether or not that's a good idea. And so as we approach the Nazi party, naturally, we're going to think of National Socialism, a part of the party name, a part of their supposed philosophy. And my question is, when you think of National Socialism, what do you think of in general? When it comes to the ideology, I tend to more associate um, National Socialism with fascism and fascism of an even more racist form than which had taken power in Italy in 1922. Um, but what took power or took root in 1933 is an even further move to the right, um, this ultra nationalism. And so as we come to the argument of were the Nazis actually socialists, my question for you is, do you consider the Nazi party to have been a socialistic party? Definitely not. <laughs> the term socialist can be misconstrued fairly easily because, you know, in in German, socialist doesn't quite carry the same meaning as it does in English. Um, But also the term socialism was still morphing at this point in time. The idea of a left-leaning and right-leaning socialist could be misconstrued from what we think of today, which is socialism is very much a left-wing thing. But in Germany at the time, For instance, in 1932, when Hitler ran for president, his opponent was the KPD, the Communist Party. And mind you, at this point, there were two main left parties in Germany at the time. There was the KPD and the the Socialist Party. So the SPD was uh, kind of a coalition of socialists. Um, and there were some right-leaning socialists in, in the SPD, but there were also some actual socialists within the uh, National Socialist German Workers' Party, which is where we get the term Nazi. A lot of those socialist elements would be purged in the Night of Long Knives. For instance, a very prominent socialist within the, the Nazi party was the leader of the SA, the, the, uh, this paramilitary arm of the... Uh, of the Nazi party, basically all of these parties at this point had paramilitary um, organizations and they'd fight each other in the streets. Weimar Germany was a very unstable republic, to say the least. With all of that being said, it's very clear that um, a lot of Nazi rhetoric was opposed to the SPD and the KPD, you know, as being leftists and affected by Jews. This whole idea of cultural Bolshevism was that Bolshevism or any kind of left leftist thought was either um, financed or created by Jews and therefore um, stabbing, stabbing Germany in the back because of the, uh, because of the end of World War One. 
that obviously does not comport with socialist thinking. So at no point are we talking about trying to control the means of production. At no point are we talking about um, the differences in class. We're talking about race warfare, which is a very different thing from, from, you know, socialism, socialism. So national socialism doesn't really have anything to do with socialism. When we approach today and people's outlooks on the past, do you believe there is a particular bias or an attempt to differentiate the Nazis in any way from the right and even capitalism? Oh yeah, definitely. (laughs) There's, there's a ton of, of um, equivocation with, you know, Nazis being somehow socialist because they happen to have socialist in the name. Um, Of course, What's forgotten about that is the national part, the thing that's literally where we derive the term Nazi. But the fact is the uh, Nazis were very right-leaning. They were ultra-nationalists by definition. They were a form of fascism, which is a far-right ideology. That also implicates... and So it's complicated when it comes to talking about like whether or not they were capitalists. Now you'll hear people on the left constantly saying, Yes, they were capitalists. They believed in privatization. They believed in uh, in um, corporate ownership of the means of the production and that kind of thing. And it's like, yes, but the USSR did literally the same thing in a number of ways. So you can't quite play that game when you start talking about specific policies. When it comes to defining... Um, the politics of, you know, whether or not something's left or right is that it has to be about its goals. And the goals of, of um, Nazism are very much aligned with um, the far right. You know, it's about creating an ethno state, one reviving um, traditional values and things along those lines. That is inherently far right. Uh, another thing to think about with the uh, in terms of the far right and everything and how and its connection to ultranationalism, fascism, um, various forms of um, dictatorial regimes and that um, is that this is the far right. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can fully disconnect conservatism in that, which is on the right side of the spectrum, or even um, moderate liberalism, which is generally on the right side of the spectrum as well, um, depending on your definition of these things. But part of the concentrated effort to disconnect these things, um, especially with this whole myth of Nazis being socialists and all that kind of stuff, is based on trying to disconnect the uh, uh, trying to obfuscate the actual goals of the far right and to make it seem more like they are just simply reactionary, which is reactionary itself is a form of uh, part of the spectrum. But also um, this is beyond reactionary. They have concrete goals. When those concrete goals start to overlap with goals of conservatism and liberalism, then it starts to get a bit worrisome for people who believe in those, Um, especially things like neoliberalism, which can often um, end up sliding into fascism. For instance, probably the first neoliberal regime of them all was Pinochet. So, and Pinochet was a fascist. So the, this slide from, from, um, from you know, just the moderate right all the way to the far right is something that people want to obfuscate. And to do so, they need to differentiate between fascism, Nazism, and all that kind of stuff and make it seem like it is not part of this right word shift. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this portion of our episode. Were the Nazis actually socialists? We have been joined by Cypher from the Cynical Historian. Definitely check out the links in the video description below. Give him your support and really take advantage of all the awesome work he is doing on YouTube. Cypher, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me.